My name is Randall Wright, and I am a book lover and a lover of libraries, and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today about a book that I've recently finished that I think you'll enjoy reading yourself. Um, I've been honored to be a part of the Friends of the Fairhope Library for the past five years, and um, I think that's why they asked me to be here this morning. It's because they see me a lot at the library. So um, I'm happy to talk today about The Boat People. This book is the fictionalized story of a real event that occurred in Vancouver, Canada in 2010. The author, Sharon Bala, spent months reading, researching, and reviewing dozens of news articles, journals, books, and interviewing the people who were closely involved in making the decisions that determined the fate of over 500 people who arrived on Canada's shores seeking a new beginning. This is Bala's first novel, and her ability to examine and explain the long, disheartening and arduous process of moving from being a refugee to becoming a legal immigrant in Canada created a touching and emotional story for me. In this picture, you're going to see a map that shows you where Sri Lanka is, which is where our refugees are coming from. This is an actual, the actual cargo ship that arrived on the shores of Vancouver in 2010, loaded with over 500 people. Um, the beginning part of the book really describes the situations and the life aboard that ship for that 8,000 plus mile journey from Sri Lanka to Vancouver. So you have, here's a picture of the cargo ship. So you can see rusted, um, very old, very, very crowded. In the United States, along with many other nations worldwide, there remains an ongoing debate about immigration, especially the issue of separating children from parents. The story that, that unfolds on the pages of this book is spellbinding, timely and unflinching in its examination of what happens when the fundamental human need of safety collides with the cold, callous reality of a bureaucracy. It is a very relevant topic in today's political climate. Bala provides a deeply compassionate lens through which to view the current crisis by sharing the lives and views of the three main characters of the book. Told through the alternating perspectives of these characters, Mahendan, a male refugee, Priya, a young female law student, and Grace, a middle-aged female adjudicator, the book allows each character to grow, change, and develop insight into the compassion, empathy, power, and intricacies needed to accept a foreign stranger into a, as a new member of a community. The protagonist, Mahendan, is an auto mechanic, a widower, and the father of a six-year-old boy, Saladin. We meet him at the beginning of the book as he lies on the deck of the rusted cargo ship, exhausted whenever he thinks of the future and terrified when he remembers the past. Mahendan spends the rest of the novel in prison with the other male refugees. His son is taken from him to stay with a female refugee in the women's prison. We learn of the horrors that Mahendan endured in the country that waged war on its citizens. We develop a strong sense of the fear that engulfs people surrounded by ethnic and racial violence. In Sri Lanka, Mahendan finds himself forced into working on a bus that is later used as a bomb that kills 17 people. When the Canadian court learns of this, he is accused of having terrorist ties, and he thinks that Canadians have let their creature comforts stifle their understanding of the complex complexities of surviving in a war-torn country. Mahendan's appointed lawyer is Priya, a second-generation Sri Lankan who reluctantly accepts the work handed off to her by a disorganized immigration lawyer when he assumes that with her Sri Lankan heritage, she'll have a better understanding of Mahendan's culture and language. Priya doesn't speak the language, but she does live with her father and her uncle and her brother and understands the culture quite well. Her ambitions, though, is, to set, is set on being a corporate lawyer and she really resents being pulled away from that work. 
She feels that representing the refugees has derailed her ambition and only lets go of this resentment after the, her uncle tells her of his own personal ties to, to the Tamil tiger terrorist. Grace is the third main character in the story. She is a third generation Japanese Canadian in her early 40s who is a civil service employee for the Canadian government. She has been selected for a new job as an adjudicator with the Immigration and Refugee Board, where she resides at each refugee's hearing and must determine their fate. Now, Grace doesn't have to sit in on all 500. She's assigned about 100 of the refugees to work with. Early on, she is influenced by her old boss who gave her this job and believes that terrorists are using civilians as covers to sneak in and can't be trusted to tell the truth. Her own parents suffered through the internment camps of the 1940s, and she finds herself caught between trying to understand struggles, struggles similar to those of her own family and her own first instinct, which is fear of newly arrived dangerous offenders. The Boat People explores the challenges and difficulties involved in making refugee claims and evaluating them. In addition, another layer conveys why cultural diversity is a powerful issue that links all of us closer together. While Canada has a reputation for being a generous and welcoming country for refugees, the re reality of how you are treated depends on when you entered and the political mood of the country. I found this book to be gripping and morally complex, a novel about a group of refugees who survive a perilous ocean voyage to reach Canada, only to face the threat of deportations and accusations of terrorism in their new land. It is a powerful, moving, and accurate account of the fears that force a person to flee their home and the strength it takes to remain resolute in their desire for a new beginning. The author of this book, um, Sharon Bauer can be seen in this slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, The Boat People was her very first novel, and it was awarded the Harper Lee Legal Fiction Award in 2019. And I want to mention just a minute about the Harper Lee Award. Um, the slide that you're seeing right now um, comes from the University of Alabama's law school. Um, they are the ones who developed this particular award 10 years ago um, when Harper Lee was still alive. They went to her. She was a law student at the University of Alabama Law School and the To Kill a Mockingbird was celebrating 50 years in publication and they thought what a fitting tribute it would be to have this special award that honors a book about good lawyers. So every year for the last 10 years this award has been given to a book that they consider the best of legal fiction. It's a, and one of the nice things about this award is that you and I can vote on the book that we think is the best. Um, the university chooses, takes in submissions all year long, and then in May they choose their three finalists. They notify people about those three finalists. You can read the books and then go online and vote in June for the one that you think is the best. And in July, the winner is announced. This last slide shows you a picture of Victor Methos, who was the author of this year, the 2020 winner, um, a book called The Hallows. And on this slide, you'll also see the list of the three finalists for 2020. Um, this award was just given about three weeks ago, um, so it's just fresh. Um, the celebration will be online in September, um, and if you go to the um, website listed on the other page that we showed you, you can actually get in on that um, virtual celebration and award ceremony. If you're looking for a good book to read and you like legal fiction, legal thrillers, mysteries, um, the list of all of the books um, that have been a part of this award is on the University of Alabama's Law School website. I hope you will find this book interesting. I recommend it. Thank you.